Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Supply Chain Issues and its Impact on Your Business, brought to you by UW Oshkosh Center for Customized Research and Aegis Financial. My name is Brian Rogers, and I'm co-host today alongside Jeff Soxy. I'm a certified financial planner here at Aegis, where our team serves as a fiduciary to our clients to help them make smart financial decisions in order to meet their goals and objectives while minimizing taxes. Today we have five panelists representing various steps along the supply chain. Uh, shortly we'll let the panelists give you a short introduction to themselves and then we'll proceed with several prepared questions for the panelists. Uh, throughout the panelists' answers, we will field questions from the audience and do our best to ask the panelists the follow-up questions at opportune times. Uh, to submit a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and our panelists. All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Jeff Saki. I'm the director at the Center for Customized Research Services at UW Oshkosh. And we are again pleased to partner with Aegis to bring you another wonderful webinar and another great panel of experts. Uh, it's our job at the university to connect uh, businesses and organizations from Northeast Wisconsin with resources such as um, what we're discussing today. We've had a lot of experience in producing market assessments and supply chain analyses for companies throughout the Fox Valley, and would, of course, be happy to talk to you about how we can connect with, uh, again, the knowledge that we have through our faculty and students. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to have the panelists introduce themselves. And um, let's start with Jay Walt, because again, I know Jay the best, and he's also a fellow Titan. All right. Thank you, Jeff. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, my name is Dr. Jay Woltz, and I'm an associate professor here at UW Oshkosh. Um, my area of expertise is supply chain disruptions. So I teach and, and do research at, at Oshkosh in the area of, of manufacturing reshoring with the emphasis on supply chain disruptions. I've been at Oshkosh for about four years now. Uh, prior to that, I spent about eight years in industry working at Kohler Company in various supply chain capacities uh, with a particular focus on the downstream part of the supply chain. So it works a lot with customer synchronization and getting product to distributors and, and then customers. So it's great to be here. Thank you, Jeff. And Carly, how about you this morning? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Carly Hughes, and I'm the Director of Procurement Operations at Mercury Marine. So at Mercury, I'm responsible for our supplier delivery performance into our manufacturing and parts and accessories to bus businesses. We have a global supply base with over 850 suppliers. And with all of the challenges over the last couple of years, we've definitely learned a lot and hopefully I can share a little bit with you. I've been at Mercury for a little bit over five years. And before that, I was in a food manufacturing organization in various finance and supply chain roles for a little bit over 10 years. Thank you. All right, thank you, Carly and Joe. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Zink, um, Vice President of Center Store Merchandising at Scogan's Festival Foods. Um, my primary role here is really working with the buyers, uh, preparing our uh, ads that come out each week, uh, procuring product uh, through our wholesaler, UNFI, um, which will add some interesting perspective today since we, we don't work directly with manufacturers for um, procuring product all the time. Um, I've been with Festival 11 years. Um, prior to that, it was with Shopco Stores. Uh, for 26 years in various roles in stores, merchandise planning, and replenishment. All right, thank you, Joe. And Scott? Uh, good morning, everybody. I am the Director of Product Management at Wall Logistics, Scott Blaming. Um, Wall Logistics provides public and contract warehouse operations, uh, managed warehouse services, transportation logistics, consulting services, build and leasing services, and inventory financing. Um, so. We're best known for warehousing, but we actually uh, work in a lot of the areas around that. Uh, my team, um, being the product uh, management director, my team oversees the development and implementation of our warehouse management software, or as we call it, our WMS, throughout the United States. Um, we've installed our WMS in about 12 warehouses since 
2016 and we're rolling out two more in 2022. Um, my career started in marketing uh, as a web and application developer before, before earning my MBA from Georgia Tech in 2011. Um, and I work pretty closely with not just our warehouses, but a number of our warehouse customers. And um, I've been with the company since about 2017. So happy to be here and looking forward to this conversation. Sorry about that. Thanks so much, Scott. Uh, it's another great acronym that we have time to learn more about. And Craig, uh, last but not least, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Oeschlager. I am the Director of Pricing and Yield with Valley Express. Uh, Valley Express is actually a conglomeration now of four companies, Valley, uh, Planet Freight, Straight Shot Express, and Capital Warehousing. Um, we do a little bit of everything um, as far as the logistics side of things go. Uh, personally, I've been in the logistics industry for a little over 35, 36 years now, uh, everywhere from operations, sales, warehousing, uh, pricing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, looking forward to the conversation this morning. Thanks. Excellent. Well, as you can see, we have a great panel here today. And Brian, I believe the first question is yours. And I believe the first question will go back to Craig. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so yeah, uh, we'll start with Craig. So um, Craig, what are the, the biggest opportunities to your company's supply chain um, and on the flip side, where do you see the biggest opportunities for success or differentiation for your company? Well, opportunity-wise, um, really it comes in expanding relationships with a tech edge to it. Um, over the past decade or so, that's been the thing, really, is to really get up on tech uh, and get data-driven information through your logistics. Um, so melding those things together, um, having a tight relationship with your customer is going to push things along to a good long-term, ex excuse me, long-term success. Apologize, I'm getting past a little COVID issue right now. Uh, but overall, uh, it's, it's going to be tech driven, at least that's what we see. Um, but you can't lose sight of the relationships. And I probably will go back to that a couple of times in our conversation, but uh, that's going to be the key. <coughs> Excuse me. Sure. Thanks, Greg. Anyone else? I think um, some of my experience is similar to Craig's um, being similar nature. And Actually, I'm also recovering from a COVID cough, so Craig, you and I will be together in this. Um, but uh, much of what Craig was saying, technology is a big focus of ours too. Um, we really are having to um, focus on efficient operations in, in this um, in this new world of ours because our customers themselves are are struggling more with shortages and other things, and we need to be flexible to accommodate them. So I also agree with the tight relationships with them. Um, a lot more EDI integration, um, trying to speed up communications, uh, limit the, the manual processes in between. Um, and uh, we're also realizing that we need to be, you know, to, to stand out, you've really got to start planning ahead a lot more in today's industry because, or in today's environment, because lead times are so long. Um, even, you know, for us, building a warehouse uh, is a much longer process, just getting the materials, the, the racking, the, the steel, the, the material handling equipment, everything has a much longer lead time. So one of the ways we're working to, to get ahead of the curve is to plan earlier, order earlier, take a few risks, you know, if we need 10 pieces of equipment, maybe we'll order 12 just to be safe. Can always turn around and sell it back in the market. You know, there's plenty of demand for things. So being a little bit smart about how we purchase and um, maybe spending a little bit more, but to um, save the headache later. Sure, and Carly, how about Mercury? Yeah, so I can definitely agree and relate with what everyone's saying, especially in the lead time side. Even if our suppliers aren't telling us that lead times are extending, we're going ahead and we have more buffer stack. We have more uh, inventory within the supply chain. But also Mercury's had a unique situation in which it's been a little bit of a wild ride from a demand standpoint. Our demand for our product is um, better than we could have ever predicted, but that also presents challenges 
within this environment. So we've been looking at data solutions that can help us bring data faster than what we would have had traditionally to help make quicker decisions, especially around transportation. And then the other thing that really has kept us going is all of those relationships that we have built with our supply base over the years, because they are choosing who to make product for, and we need them to choose Mercury. And it's, we've been creative with raw material, but we've also been making sure that we're staying very, very close to our, our supply partners to make sure that supply keeps coming in for us. Sure, thanks Carly. Uh, Joe, anything to add on the festival food side? Um, yeah, first the relationship uh, part of this for us, and I mentioned UNFI earlier, uh, in my introduction, UNFI uh, is a natural United you know, Natural Foods company um, had purchased Super Value. Some of you may be familiar with the name Super Value. They're our wholesaler, and I think our our relationship with them is one of the key components that's helped us get through these last couple of years in terms of dealing with uh, supply chain because such a strong relationship. I feel that's that's helped us in many ways. Where it doesn't help you is they. They are an extra layer between you and the manufacturer and the void that's taken place today is one of the manufacturer telling us they have product and shipped and we're trying to find if there's this void in between the manufacturer and the wholesaler. And then there's how do you make sure that when UNFI is servicing several other customers other than just festival foods, how do you make sure you're getting your fair share of the pie? Uh, as many of you uh, shop for groceries, uh, you're probably seeing holes on the shelves, uh, items that you haven't uh, been able to get, things like that. So um, that's been one of the challenges. Our opportunity is really to be helpful in our stores to our guests. Hopefully there's other options for them. And, uh, and, and that's another key piece of what's helped us through this time frame is just being really strong with our service with our guests and helping them. Sure, uh, Jay, anything to add here? Otherwise we can, uh, Jeff's got the next question. Other, other than I think sustainable business operations are, are a theme that I've seen throughout the, the, the panelists here. Um, you know, risky strategies in this environment are, are proving to, to not be as, as fruitful. And I think most businesses are just trying to weather the storm right now, so. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, so for the next question, I would be remiss as someone who represents a university and has a lot of experience in workforce development without uh, bringing up the talent issue, um, because we know it's something that has been widely spoken about in the press over the course of at least the fall into the winter. Um, but I think it's something that isn't widely recognized, especially for its upstream and downstream effects, you know, again, in the logistics industry more broadly. Um, so and I'll start with I'll start with Joe on this, just because of again where your position within your organization. Um, but what are the types of, of impacts that you're seeing both on the upstream sides of getting product into your stores as well as kind of the downstream side as far as um, actually sourcing products uh, for customers? Uh, and what what do you think the role talent has had on this, and um, where do you think it might be headed in the future? Um, wow, I could spend a lot of time talking about the challenges throughout here. Um, you know, I'm getting alerts every day on product that's being going on allocation and promotions, uh, marketing funds are being pulled and you're not going to see those items advertised until into June. Um, that's the kind of time frames we're working on. Uh, working out further for us has been key. Labor uh, in all of this. Uh, for UNFI has been a challenge. Uh, we've had instances where they've needed to smooth the size of our orders relative to the amount of labor they have on hand that given day uh, to get out what they can out of their warehouses. Um, another one of our key suppliers, uh, Kemp's, who's, who's a terrific partner with us, uh, they've had mandatory overtime. Of course, the implication of that is 
and the cost of all the different materials and components of manufacturing have also gone up. So um, you're starting to hear a lot about the inflation of uh, grocery items and other products in the supply chain. Um, labor directly for us in the stores, a um, little more difficult and even at our, our support office, a little more difficult to find people. What used to be you'd get 10 to 12 applicants, now you're getting about three or four applicants. Um, that's one of the challenges we're seeing right now. All right, thanks. And Scott or Craig, do you want to weigh in? You know, obviously, we know that uh, driver shortages have been an issue, at least in my understanding, for at least the last 15 years. Um, so this is not a new issue. I'd just be curious to see how the pandemic has changed that. Well, I'll hop in first then, Craig, unless you want to jump. But uh, um, because I can actually speak a little bit, um, uh, WOW actually does serve the um, grocery industry, we we have a number of customers and we handle a lot of dairy products, very high turnover, milk, um, cultured products, butters and things like that. Um, and one thing I've seen in uh, one of our warehouses um, in particular for, for that industry is due to COVID high turnover. So it's a high um, uh, employee warehouse, lots of people because of the frequency and, and speed of the operation. Um, when COVID has hit, we've had a lot more absenteeism. So we've had to hire up from that. Um, but of course, yes, the market is much tighter, so it means higher wages, a lot more spending on retention and hiring bonuses. Um, we have to be very careful, and of course, how we protect our warehouse too, because if you get spread in the warehouse, you can take down an entire warehouse, which can take down grocery stores. So um, I've certainly seen it though. I mean, milk, uh, cows keep producing, the milk is coming in, so we're, we're not short on having the product, but boy, um, it doesn't take much to disrupt that, that very quick up and efficient operation to keep delivering things out. Um, so wages, yes. And, um, yep, eventually, you know, that will have to be passed on, um, to, to the companies that hold product in our warehouses too. So when we talk about inflation and things, um, all this is factoring you have to have more people available in the warehouses to operate them. Um, I'm just looking at some notes here that I had on too. Um, yeah, just simply due to the, the limited availability of employees having to pay the higher wages to get them. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear that over and over again, but again, pay, it plays into higher costs. Um, I do. Hope and feel that the uh, the the trend will will improve over the next couple of years. I know part of the question, at least in the, the that was provided ahead of time, was do we see that changing over the next uh, you know couple months or years, or whatever? I think it's going to improve. I think we'll get more people in the workforce personally, but I am worried about the older generation, the baby boomers retiring and being such a large group. I actually, as hopeful as I am for more people coming back, I actually think we may still be struggling with with shortages uh, in, in human resources for a while. Jeff, I'd like to add one thing to that. Um, that was really well said in that, in that dairy industry, in my example with Kemp's, one of the things we did was we asked Kemp's to come visit us, visit us in person. Let's talk about our business and what's currently happening out there. And it goes back to the whole relationship side of it. One of the things we did was we took a hard look at the number of deliveries per week by store, what the volume now is, what we anticipate the volume to be, really changed it up the schedule uh, for them uh, to be more efficient, make sure we're maximizing cube and, and, you know, not having too many deliveries because, you know, they're a great customer. They were going to do whatever they needed to do for us. And if a truck wasn't completely full, they were going to make sure our stores get milk on time. Okay. But that's not helping them. Right. And it's not making them efficient. And it's not something that was going to necessarily benefit us but it was really gonna help them out. And you have to do that in these times, you have to do some things outside of the normal, what you do to help your, your suppliers and your, and your key relationships. Yeah, thanks for that, Joe. Uh, Craig, what are you seeing over there? Well, I, I think the driver shortage has been well discussed and I think we can all agree that it's, it, it, it is a real thing. Uh, there are parts of the country where you may or may not, uh, I mean, statistically speaking, it could, it could be said that it's not quite as bad here, quite as bad there, but it is a real thing um, and it's going to continue. Uh, the pressure with everything coming over uh, that you see at the ports, um, it, it all flows downhill, right? So, you know, you, you get it to the port, okay, well, now it's, chances are it's got to get unloaded into, the, into a warehouse. Well, what warehouse? They're they're full. Uh, you know, how far inland can you bring it? Um, and all those, it, it, all, the more touches you have on something, 
the more the cost goes up. So it is tough. Uh, for our own company, um, when it comes to drivers, uh, the most attrition that we have really is through retirements. Um, we're a little bit unique. Our business model is a little bit different than, than your standard uh, trucking company, at least in the Valley Express side. Um, we, we have drivers that are home daily rather than over the road and living a much harder life than actually just being outside all day, you know, in the elements. So it, it's a little bit better. But that said, um, you know, for the number of years I've been there, I've been with Valley for uh, 18 plus years now. Uh, with the drivers that we have retiring now, it's not dropping our average driver age. That is still late 50s. Um, and without, with, without seeing a, a, you know, a younger group coming in, uh, you know, able to take the reins on those type of things, um, it, there's going to be some pressure there. Um, so, you know, it's going to be tough, uh, wage wise, um, you know, the, the costs that have been going up in transportation, uh, you know, the owner of our company made a, a, a great observation. He said, you know, you know, we're, we're we're having to charge more uh, for what we're doing, but that money is pretty much just flowing right to the drivers because we've got to pay more to keep those guys in. Uh, you know, 18 years ago, what was a $12, $13 an hour job, uh, if you can believe that, is a, you know, 20 to $25 an hour job. Um, and maybe that's not even the right number. Uh, but you know, it's a moving target that we work with. So the, the driver shortage is going to, is real and, uh, it's, it's going to be here for a while. Uh, so it's, it'll be a struggle. Yeah. So Carly, what, do, oh, sorry about that. Carly, what do you see in it, Merck? Cause I know that again, you know, bringing product in is going to affect, you know, how your lines run. Uh, and obviously you've got that everyone has hiring issues. So. You know, just curious as to what you're seeing kind of as a company on this. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, for Mercury on our hiring side, we've seen some major adjustments in, in wage for the hourly workforce, but we're also having shortages on the salary side. It's just equally as difficult to find someone uh, geographically, especially if for a certain role, we're not willing to go to a remote option. But as we look at our supply base, labor has become a huge piece of our conversation, especially with our domestic supply base. Labor is almost in every single conversation. And we're seeing it with inconsistent support on the trucking side. I think we've been fairly successful. We have a, a pretty large international supply base, fairly successful dealing with the port issues because we've honestly just thrown a lot of money at it. Um, but we are paying for premium service with freight in a lot of times in the past where we wouldn't have had to do that. And one of our internal jokes is our expedite carriers are our best suppliers. So I look at straight shot and I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Um, but, but you pay for that and that's all costs that go into the business. But we're seeing general lead time extensions just because every supplier is dealing with labor issues. Either they don't have them or they're absent, or they trained someone and now today they're not showing up. So it, it's completely all over and it's really starting to change our conversation when we're sourcing with suppliers. Geographically, those conversations are happening because certain parts of the country are hit harder than other parts. And then other conversations that we're having are in terms of automation and what we can do when we have a, a new product or we're sourcing a new part at a supplier and how we can take labor out of the picture, especially when we're sourcing domestically within the United States. So it's really changing us from a day-to-day -day standpoint as well as a strategy standpoint looking two to three years out. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and Jay, I promise we won't call on you last for every question. Um, but I'm also curious from your perspective, obviously, you teach a lot of students and a lot of students come through your programs in this. And what are the, some of the changes you're seeing in some of the students and student interests? Obviously, we know that the pandemic has changed a lot of what our students are looking at. 
Yeah, this is, is such an important discussion because, you know, I tell my students every day that it's such a great time to be in supply chain. Um, our best students are getting locked up over a semester in advance. I have employers coming to me and saying they, they need they need somebody strong in, in this role. And, and I have nothing for them because all of our students have job offers well in advance of graduation. Um, and many of them have bidding wars for for their their services, which is is is, is so good to see. But you know, causes a, a pinch point for for employers in the in the valley. So, um, you know, what we've we've been doing is trying to encourage other business students and, and other students in the university to to take an interest in supply chain, um, and. Uh, that's that's helped. We've been pushing more and more classes online. We launched an online BBA, so students can now uh, take all of our classes online as opposed to to coming to campus, which I think will will help. But it's going to take a while, right? I mean, you can't get a, a degree in a couple of months, so um, you know there's there's certainly a, a bottleneck there. You know, I think when we we talk about the talent shortages, it's it's in both white collar and, and blue collar positions. Um, part of it is, you know, temporary and that, you know, you you have people that are out, out due to COVID issues and, and quarantining. I spoke to my brother who's at, at Kimberly Clark and, and he said right now they have upwards of 50% of their employees out with COVID quarantine uh, types of types of issues. So that, I think that's a temporary pinch point. In, in the supply chain that a lot of organizations are, are dealing with. And I think a relevant discussion topic too is, is what has been dubbed in, in popular press as the great resignation, right? You know, you have people um, resigning for either better opportunities, more flexible opportunities, um, you know, opportunities that, that pay a little bit better um, you know, so so that's I think uh, an issue as well, where those those employees that transition from one dot job to another aren't fully productive. There's a learning curve uh, for for months and and even in some positions several several years before they're going to get up to to full productivity. So, you know, employers really need to think about you know recruiting strategies, the the best recruiting strategies that they can put into place, and. And not only that, but, you know, making their current workforce feel appreciated. Um, you know, that's that's huge. Understanding what's important for, for each individual. Uh, if, if they're productive individuals, you, you don't want to lose them. So. Jeff, I just like to add to that. Yeah, I, I was absolutely. waiting to hear if the word appreciated would come out on that and it did. And I was so happy to hear that. And that is so true. You know, I haven't been here my whole career at festival, but coming in here, there's that sense of appreciation you get from people, how they celebrate you. Um, there was a culture here already of servant leadership and taking care of people and just appreciating people in these last two years. It's the, if you don't appreciate those folks, somebody else will. And that's been the message and it's getting in, you know, when we get into our stores and we visit with our department managers, uh, we had a little bit of a joke going. It used to be, you know, if the truck showed up an hour late, everybody was up in arms. Now we're saying, hey, if the truck shows up, high five. Doesn't matter what time it got there, right? So there's there's a level of empathy we have to have for, and, and not only the people within your own company, but within the people that serve your company. Uh, for us, it's it's our warehouse with super value here in Green Bay. Um, whether it's, you know, giving those folks some gift cards for the holidays or going over and, and having a lunch on us for them or just spending some time in the warehouse, shaking some hands and talking with them. I mean, just building a relationship with them. That has been so critical to this whole thing. So Jay, I just applaud you for bringing that up. I think that is so key because I don't think it's always about the wages. It's about how people are made to feel during this time frame and uh, making feel that they're contributing and helping. I, I just yeah, I mean, read that article in, in Fast Company that I'm going to post in the in the chat here if I can. It's it's here's a, a simple reason why your employees want to quit, <clears throat> and a lot of people think it's it's about pay and and it's about you know working remote and those are certainly reasons. But 
um, you know, the focus of the article was was on appreciation rather than than those other two things. So I'm going to post that in the in the chat. Sorry, go ahead, whoever uh, I cut off here. Yeah. No, uh, it's all right. Um, I wanted to highlight another point you made, Jay, and uh, you talked about um, with the turnover and the uh, ramp up time and less productivity. Um, that may not be so obvious on the surface, but actually that's something that we're recognizing kind of indirectly as we're developing our software. We're because of having new hires so often, we're having to modify, again, the way we do business, our software to be much more intuitive, um, to require less training because training resources are limited. Um, and the ramp up time, we can't have so many mistakes, especially when we're trying to deliver to you know, um, organizations like Joe um, efficiently without interruption. You've got to be able to bring people on much faster and get them up to speed and productive much faster. And that's a challenge. So, again, that technology idea that we brought up before, too, comes back into play again. Got to leverage that. It, it doesn't look like the chat is open. I'll, I'll send this uh, to Courtney. I'll send the link to Courtney and, and maybe you can share this, this Courtney. Yeah, we'll be happy to get it out to everybody after the after the call. Um, I see that we do have a question, um, and I'll just open this again up to everybody. Um, so, uh, Gail and Killam asked, beyond appreciating people to keep employees, what are you all doing to hire, land more hires? Um, I think that's a pretty obvious question. I think we started to get there, but um, who wants to uh, open this one up? If everybody's quiet, I'll, I'll hop in. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, I, I have a feeling we're, we're all going to have similar answers, but um, for, in our corporate offices, we, we've certainly had to explore much more remote um, you know, options. Um, for one, people do want to work from home more, so just to keep them, that's part of it. But in hiring, um, going outside of the area, you know, having people commute in limits our range of hiring to about 45 minutes, right? Nobody wants to drive more than that about that. Um, so that's been a change. Um, to land more bonuses. Um, higher wages, all, all the standard stuff that that's all part of the discussions and, and very much aware to all of us who are hiring. Um, you know, the numbers that come back and what people are asking for kind of look sometimes surprising, but we might only have one or two candidates and you have to really consider it. So I got, I got to answer easy. <laughs> Thanks, um, Scott. Um, in panels, maybe before we get back into this question, Brian, it might be a good opportunity for you to open the poll and, and discuss that with the attendees. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Courtney's got the poll question uh, ready to roll here. Um, so this is where we look for a little audience participation. Um, the whole question here is what aspects of the supply chain uh, do you see as the biggest risk to business? And then we ask you to select the top two. So while well, audience is kind of in a few minutes to do that, let's uh, get back to the, uh, the new hire question. Sure, and I'll bring that back in and just wanted to also mention that Laura Viles, or Laura Vise, and, and I'll make sure I make that pronunciation. Uh, correctly. I also asked, you know, again, I think it's an interesting framing question for this new hire point. Um, she's curious as to why you all work where you do. And again, it's a question of, um, you know, your career choices and the role that appreciation plays in your own retention. Um, so, you know, curious to hear, again, outside of the the obvious ones about, you know, more flexible hours, more flexible um, uh landscapes, bonuses, what are what are some of the other tactics that you're hearing? Because again, uh, we know that these are positions and these are these are careers that may be a little bit more place-based um, than others in organizations. So Car Carly, what are what are you guys doing over at Merck? So at Mercury, we've we've done the obvious, you know, wage um, and benefits, but we've also spent a lot of time working on how we onboard. And once someone says yes to us and we say yes to them, what does their first couple of weeks look like? And we found, especially with hourly positions, that if someone wants to make a change and they're not happy, they're not sticking around for a year. They're, they're finding the next thing because something's available right away. So it's, it, kind of, it goes back to, I guess, what we've been talking about with appreciation because it's how can we touch base within their ramp up 
ramp up time? How do they have a relationship with the people that they work with and they have a relationship with their supervisor? Because we found that when someone feels connected to the company and even feels connected to what we do uh, within our market, then they're more proud of what they do and they're happier. And overall, Brunswick has great, great benefits. But if they can get acclimated to the work culture and they feel connected um, every single day, then we found that they're going to stay. We make a really, really cool product and it's easier to connect with that. In the past, I've worked at the food, in the food industry and we're making, you know, 2000 pound super sacks of, you know, powdered dairy. And, and that was hard to connect with. But here it's a little bit easier because you can see and that's tangible and we are close to a lake and, and people have that in their lifestyle. So if we can connect with them day to day and person to person, that works a lot better. Yeah, thanks. And Joe, what are you seeing up at festival? I, I think the, you know, as, as Carly mentioned, you know, we had to go back and evaluate wages probably over a year ago already um, because as things were starting to move in our business and our industry. But, you know, keeping things fun at work is so important, <clears throat> whether it's we, we have just tremendous participation. And I know this sounds maybe kind of silly sometimes, but something like Halloween, when you have 60 to 80 people in your office of 100 people and everybody's dressed up for Halloween, right? And there's activities that go on and things. And then we have, we do those same things in the stores, whether it's Boo Fest and how do you have a lunch on us for everybody? And hey, thanks for a great year. And again, it goes back to appreciating the people you have and then that word of mouth. I mean, one of the things I've heard recently around the office is people are trying to uh, fill jobs around here is people are networking and talking to each other and hey, say, hey, do you know someone that, da, 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 you know, you're having this conversation with people and you're actually trying to help our HR staff and finding people. And it's like, hey, you know, I could call so-and-so and talk to their mom and dad. And yeah, they're interested in being a cashier at this store. And we're looking for somebody in neat department over here. And there's a lot more networking going on within the company um, as there ever has been before. And we've always said here that, you know, we're more likely to look at somebody if there's a connection to somebody that already works here. We think that there's probably a quality to that person that they would bring and we're, and we're more confident with that than just somebody blind walking in off the street and uh, uh, applying for a job. You know, that that has worked for us to find a lot of people in this company just through relationships. Go ahead, Brian. So, uh, yeah, Jeff, I believe Courtney's got the, the poll results that should mm -hmm. pop open here. And then, um, and then we do have a nice follow-up question that kind of keeps on that same topic, but let's, uh, let's, let's interrupt with the poll a little bit, and then uh, we'll get back to the, the follow-up question here. Sure, sounds good. Um, so just in terms of, of results, I mean, we, we you know, received a pretty wide array, but you know, the top three uh, biggest risks that people are, are identifying is, you know, in not surprising given this morning's discussion are material sourcing, logistics, and pricing. Um, and I think we've covered some of the sourcing and logistics issues and we'll, we'll continue to discuss those, but um, I would again be remiss uh, to not put my economist hat on a little bit and talk about inflation because I know that the fourth quarter GDP numbers uh, were just released about an hour ago. Um, and it looks like on an annualized basis, at least prices or GDP grew at about five and a half percent over the course of last year. So beating everyone's expectations. And I think we've all seen what has been happening in the fall with durable goods pricing and some of the other uh, commodities prices that have hap uh, been moving. Um, so, so Jay, from your perspective, what are you seeing or how are you seeing companies react, at least in you know, what you've been looking at? Yeah, so I think the the poll isn't a huge surprise. I see material sourcing and logistics um, really interrelated. So so those are are the top two. Um, you know, when when it comes to um, sourcing, you know, one of my my areas of of research is is manufacturing reshoring. So I see more and more companies trying to to bring work stateside. 
um, especially bringing work in house when they they can either either temporarily or or longer term. So you know, what we call insourcing. Um, I'd be interested to hear whether or not some of the panelists you're, you're doing that across your your companies or or other people on the on the uh, the call. Um, you know, I, I see that as a as a continued trend. Uh, for for greater flexibility across the supply chain, especially in times where forecasting difficulty or for, forecast accuracy is becoming increasingly difficult. I think when when many organizations look at their their forecast accuracy numbers over the past six months, um, it's there's there's a lot of shock because it's just difficult to predict what what demand is is going to be. Uh, if if you would have asked somebody a year ago whether or not you you expect the economy to grow at at 6.9% gdp for the last quarter 6.9% i mean that's that's crazy uh, nobody would have expected that kind of growth and and when you under forecast you the chances are you simply don't have enough product uh, to to serve your customers so um, you know those those are some of the big things that i i see as i, I reflect upon the poll Yeah, I'll jump in here, Jeff, just to see. Thanks, what, Joe. Yeah, just to talk about what's happening there. So, you know, we've still got pressure of uh, the sales side of it because of people still not out and about like they were pre-pandemic, whether it's restaurants, bars, uh, whatever. We're still seeing some of that affects to us and benefit to us of, you know, somewhat more business. Um, what Jay talked about, you know, I'm thinking of an example. Uh, there's many companies I deal with, whether it's Quaker, who has the Gatorade brand, uh, Kraft Heinz, who has, of course, a, a ton of different uh, brands and products, but they're investing a significant amount of capital in terms of increasing production and capacity and also getting their arms around their own components. So with Gatorade, one of the big issues we had is they could not get enough bottles. They, they could produce all the liquid they wanted, but they didn't have the bottles to put it in and they weren't really in control of that. And that was also the same for the soda industry for a period of time about a year ago is aluminum cans, the blanks, uh, they don't have uh, control over that supply. Um, there's probably two or three manufacturers that really control all of that. And then um, the cans being produced and then the bottlers are buying from them. So um, they're all starting to look at, as Jay said, getting their arms around that, bringing that into the state so they know exactly what they have. And that's whether it's bottles, caps, labels, um, all of those different components. And, and that's why I, I would tell you, I think this is gonna last uh, quite a while yet, uh, because you still have those gaps where they don't have control over those components in their manufacturing. Yeah, and I think that, thanks for the, the comment, Joe. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people really fail to appreciate is the role that components and commodities play within, you know, the finished product space. And that's something that I know that Wisconsin has always had an issue with in its manufacturing base and that so much of the emphasis of what we make goes into other things rather than are the, the end product themselves. You know, in Carly, of course, mercury is one of the rare uh, counterpoint examples of that. But um, what jumped it out to you in the poll results, or poll results rather? Yeah, I, I guess I'm not surprised. I think some of the convert, some of the points that Jason was making about whether we're insourcing or outsourcing or a combination of both, we've felt that and we're evaluating our supply chains and we've we've done in sourcing and there's been some things that have been quick hitters maybe some light assembly that maybe someone was doing but they weren't doing it fast enough or they they weren't managing it appropriately that we've brought in house some of those things are moving slower where there's strategic products or parts to mercury that in the past we've had another organization assemble and, and procure for us and we're going ahead and we're moving those within Mercury so that we have control and we think that we'll do a better job of supporting our own factory than those suppliers are doing. We're also seeing though that our supply base is evaluating at a record pace whether they want to keep doing what they're, they've been doing and a lot of it we share a supply base with automotive and a lot of what we're seeing is that technology shift between 
our old technology and electrification. And that is changing our supply base and changing the structure of what our suppliers are looking at within their own businesses very quickly. And so we're trying to react to that and put our own strategy together about how we're gonna deal with that. And that includes supply chain redesign, bringing things within Mercury that normally hadn't been there. And it also changes what we're looking at from an acquisition strategy. So all of those things, you know, small picture day to day, but then big picture to, you know, what does our business look like in the next few years? So it's super interesting um, and gives us a lot of work. Uh, and I don't think it's anything like we've ever seen before. Yeah, I know that my my father is an avid fisherman, so he's always you know interested in looking at product categories and wondering you know when he's going to be able to get his first plug-in hybrid um, trout boat to go go on Lake Michigan. So uh, always always looking forward to that. Uh, Craig or Scott, do you have anything that you want to add from the poll? I see Scott's good. I can jump in there. Um, yeah, it, the the thing that we see quite a bit. I mean, uh, obviously the poll is what you would expect, materials. Um, what we've seen, uh, at least on the transportation side, is not only insourcing, but let's geographically get that raw material or whatever we're looking for uh, closer. How close can we find it? Um, we deal with a variety of, of clients and we've got some where they've got uh, material uh, suppliers that are relocating or opening satellite facilities close by, uh, you know, if they're not actually doing the work themselves internally. So getting that, getting those raw materials close by is really going to be a key. Now, are they available? Where do those materials have to come from that have to, you know, be further processed, et cetera, et cetera. That's a key as well. And it's not the same for everyone. Uh, but finding that is a big, a big side of things. Um, and as far as uh, the inflation side goes, uh, you know, for years, um, it, from our side, we've always looked at it and said, you know, transportation, you get about a six, excuse me, about a six month lead time on how the economy is going. Uh, you know, the general, general public doesn't necessarily see a slowdown until much later, but in transportation, huh, things have lightened up a little bit. Uh, now, typically you get around Christmas and then into the first quarter of basically any year, and that's your slowdown. It's not happening. Uh, in fact, the, the slowdown that occurred was mainly because of the holiday, Christmas holiday and New Year's, and that's only because people really aren't working. Uh, and it's ramped up again to, you know, regular fourth quarter levels. Uh, was on a webinar yesterday that gave information that, uh, uh, you know, electronic tenders, uh, automated tenders that are going out to carriers, uh, there's upwards of a 25% rejection rate still. Uh, whereas, you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, that rejection rate in, in, in uh, excuse me, January uh, was about five and a half, six percent. Uh, which over the course of time was pretty typical. So we're still in a period of it's going to be tight. You got to have your you got to have your ducks in a row and your planning well in hand. I may add just yes. in terms of um, transportation because I know we've talked about driver shortages and other things, but something else I'm observing is a shift um, more looking at rail again. Um, rail isn't uh, a preferred transportation method. It's not reliable and not as reliable in terms of timing. It takes longer, but when you can't get trucks, that's an alternative. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, reopening our rail doors, our rail spurs um, at some of the warehouses to account for you know, uh, customer interest in that now. Yeah, thanks so much. And Brian, I see that we have a number of questions backing up. So I wanted to see if you wanted yeah. to clear that backlog. Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely want to get to all the, the the questions that were submitted. And if we don't get to them, we'll try to have a panelist um, reach out in an email after the fact. Um, but Dan started um, 
He says, how are current employees handling the fact that new employer, new employees are likely coming in at better pay or sign on bonuses or more vacation? Um, have you guys had to address that with your current employees? And let's, any, any volunteers for first? I can speak to that. Um, with our driver force, uh, people in our warehouse, uh, if we've got a need or if there's a shift where we've got to have a higher pay, a better package, um, that kind of goes hand in hand with the rest of the group. So we're not just giving, uh, you know, the next two people that, that raise, that's going to affect other people, you know, in, with a similar role, uh, goes within the office as well. Um, obviously, uh, there's some sub subjectivity to that. Um, you know, not everyone is created equal. Unfortunately, that's kind of the way things goes. Uh, people have different experiences, different uh, strengths. So you work with those things, but for the most part, yeah, um, it's uh, it's not just a, a, hey, bring your cell plan over to us and we're gonna give you a brand new phone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, you work for those, you do the, do those things for the people that are there because those are the people that need it and deserve it and we've been proactive to look at our current employees and, and you know look at the market rates and other things and, and make adjustments as necessary because we don't want to lose them um it's too easy and too ha too quick so um got to be proactive yeah anyone else feel uh Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one, which really interesting as well here. So, um, so Bob asks, uh, would you consider the retiring workforce? So we talked about a lot of the baby boomers. Um, do you see those as a resource for filling like part-time positions? I can jump in here as well. Um, very much so. Uh, now. When it comes to transportation, uh, you know, truck drivers, once they're, majority of them, once they retire, they're retired. Uh, they might come back and help out here or there, uh, but it really depends on the type of work you're, you're talking about. Um, it's it, very much like construction. Um, there's only so much the body can take. Uh, you know, so you've got you've to be careful. You've got to have, uh, you know, driver-friendly operations. Uh, that make it work, but part time is something that we do look for uh, within our straight shot uh, entity. Uh, we have a number of part time uh, retirees, etc., um, and it's a it's a very good model. Expedite is a little bit different, uh, you know, than your typical trucking, but uh, it does work if you can tap into that. Uh, keep the people that you've had full time, uh, you know, bring them in. Uh, when you can, typically it's in the warmer months, uh, but you know, we deal with that. Uh, but it's, it, it is, at least from our standpoint, uh, retirees, turning them into a part-time option, definitely. All right, um, yeah. I think we'll move, up. go ahead, Scott. Nope, uh, it was quiet. I was only going to say that I'm not close enough to our to our hiring uh, to the HR group to have anything to contribute. Sure. Okay, let's move on to um, the next question. Kind of gets to one of the next prepared questions that we had as well. So, really, what are some strategies that um, you are taking to improve the, be it the visibility, the agility, or the flexibility of the supply chain? What new strategies have you learned? Uh, so Carly, why don't we start with Merck? Sure. There's been, I guess, a, a lot of things that we've been doing. On the agility side, we've been exploring different supply bases, especially when we look at things that have had global shortages. I'm thinking of some commodity shortages around resin. We know that we've had a, a lot of issues there, semiconductors. So we've developed new suppliers, but also something that I think that worked really well for us is we always had a very global view. So if we can't find it here, 
maybe we can find it overseas. And we have teams in Europe and we have teams in China and South Korea. And it was really all hands on deck. And we found material in places we didn't think we could find material. And I think that really helped us from the creativity side. Also, you know, sometimes we would spec ourselves into a certain material, but opening up conversations with engineering about how we might be able to be more creative or, or do we really need this super, super premium? Can we take, you know, this spec or this spec that might help us open up things? We're looking at agility software that helps us look deep within our supply chains. We don't have just a supplier A makes a part and it ships to Mercury. They are very, very tiered. So our, our stuff might start, part of it might start in Korea and China and Vietnam, and then it all comes together and it's assembled. So it's not complicated. And to understand the bottlenecks and capacity, that's a very hard thing to do unless someone has it in their head. So we're using software to help us have a more global view of our supply chain and constraints. And I would say the other thing is just the relationship side, um, making sure that we're leveraging the relationships with our existing suppliers to make sure that um, we get parts and they can even help us. Like I know the question up here says lack of soda bottles. Well, we had not soda bottles as an issue, but resin. So what we did is we took up with a different resin manufacturer and Mercury procured a whole bunch of resin and dished it out to our suppliers. So that because they weren't getting supply because maybe they were buying in smaller quantities from DuPont or something, we took that buy and then we were the distributor to make sure that they were, we were getting enough parts for what we needed. So we've done a bunch of things like that. Also on the semiconductor side, purchasing within distribution and feeding our suppliers, working directly with the NX, trying to get our spot in line doesn't always work. Uh, but if you pay a premium and you have a lot of different distributor contacts, normally you can find what you're looking for. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Yeah, interesting. Always nice having the purchasing power to the, the, the size. Um, anyone else want to chime in? Two, two things that I've seen from businesses that have come to speak at Oshkosh uh, that I thought were, were genius ways to uh, make sure that you're you're using your limited resources most effectively. One is reducing your SKU portfolio. So for organizations that are manufacturing based and have a wide breadth of, of SKUs that they offer to the market, um, typically right now, anything you put on the shelf is going to sell. So you have to determine what's, what's going to sell consistently and, and put that onto the shelf as opposed to you know, producing 10 varieties of, of the same thing. Um, what that enables organizations to do is to more quickly manufacture the product and, and get it out to the, to the market um, and, and not lose a lot of margin. So, you know, when we think of the toilet paper shortage, Kimberly Clark is, comes to, to mind that, you know, they're, they're producing a limited number of SKUs and they're putting those onto the shelf. The second one is, focusing on high margin products. So typically, you know, when you have limited uh, supply of, of a raw material or a component, that component can go into multiple different finished goods and you have to figure out, you know, even if it's not uh, FIFO sequence, so you're overriding first in, first out, you know, you wanna make sure that that component and raw material gets to your highest margin product first as opposed to, to simply producing a FIFO sequence where you're, you're likely going to lose margin. I might speak just a little bit to FIFO and FIFO too. It rang a bell for us. Um, and you guys, everybody keeps talking about the customer relationship, but that's one of the creative ways to work around some of things has been relaxation of the strict, for us it's FIFO, first expiration, first out. So getting the oldest product out first and big customers don't want older product to uh, arrive, you know, a day later than they just received newer product. Um, now with a phone call, they're much more inclined to say, yeah, we'll take it, you know, even if it's a little bit older. Um, there may be more deal making too. This product's about to expire. So you know, in the grocery industry, milk only has, you know, 18 days, roughly, you know, shelf life. And we can only ship it up to like 14 days left on it. Well, some, some grocers might say, send us, you know, 12. It's okay. We'll take it. So. Again, just everybody being a little more flexible. Um, but if you're buying groceries, um, go early, get them, get them quick.
Joe, any counterpoints you want to add there? No, appreciate everyone's business. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks much. Um, Jay, I want to go back to you with the, the next question, just because of the fact that you're closer, closest to the training space. But um, Rachel Miller asks, if the, is the education of a future employer having a larger impact on over the experience that they are bringing to the table? And I guess this goes back to, again, the hiring issues that we're seeing in, in the industry in that it's harder to find people experienced in the, in the field because we have fewer people entering the field um, to begin with to get that industry. So, Jay, what kind of things are you seeing from the training side as far as you know, what, what companies might be doing to narrow that gap? And then be interested to see what the panelists, ha uh, what the industry folks have to say. Sure. So I, I would say, you know, when it comes to, to hiring um, on the education front and the experience front, uh, organizations are having to be more and more flexible on, on both areas. So, you know, when it comes to uh, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and, you know, if, if they can only find the right candidate with a bachelor's degree, um, most organizations aren't bad at an eye today, whereas, you know, three years ago, they, they would. Um, you know, I think it, it depends on the, the position in terms of, of what you're looking for, um, for, for, you know, that experience versus education balance. I, I don't want to speak broad based. I think it's, it's situationally dependent. Um, you know, but, you know, I, I'd say more and more organizations are, are saying, you know, what we want to find the right person and, you know, we'll, we'll train that person in terms of, of education and experience if, if they don't have it today. So. Excellent. And I see that you know, we've lost Joe here. So, um, anybody else in the middle row of the gallery want to respond? For us, at least for me, hiring um, education hasn't, uh, you know, the degree has never been as important, but I'm more in IT and a lot of the people we look at the best in, best ones have demonstrated on their own what they're interested in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I look always look to what have you accomplished more than what degree do you have? Um, but I'm just one individual. Some people I know, you know, even when I looked for jobs in the past, sometimes if you didn't have the right resume, the right education, it was a factor. I mm -hmm. suspect that it's less so in today's market. Well, Jeff, I know we're mm -hmm. we're running up against the clock here. It's about nine o'clock. So yeah, let's, absolutely. Let's wrap, yeah, let's wrap up with just mm -hmm. um, one one good ending question. So, mm -hmm. what what best practices throughout the the whole pandemic and recovery? Um, what best practices may have started as temporary measures, but do you be, do you see becoming permanent in the industry? Uh, one comes to mind right away for, for me, and I think it's the re more remote work or less time in the office. I think that's going to stay. Um, and it, it, there's a business value to it too, right? Because you don't have to build as, you know, expand your building um, or pay as much for rent, heat, et cetera, whatever it might be. Um, so hoteling, you know, we have software installed so we can check out a desk before coming in the morning. I think that's going to stick around a lot longer. And the whole team Zoom um, way of doing business, I think, is here to stay. Uh, I can pop in. Um, one of the things that we've seen over the last year and a half to two years is much more visibility on upcoming orders. Uh, we've got customers, uh, it, I should back up, typically uh, in transportation, you may have anywhere from 24 to, you know, 24 hours to maybe three days. That was pretty standard as far as notice as to when an order needs to be moved. Um, we've got clients now that are pressing anywhere between four and six weeks out. Um, so the, the statement earlier by Jay, uh, you know, regarding, uh, what are you going to produce? You've got the best, uh, you know, for your yield, et cetera, et cetera. I think those production models are really coming into play because we're seeing, uh, a much bigger visibility opportunity. Uh, it allows us to you know, be able to plan well ahead. Um, for a lot of trucking companies that run, 
you know, very, very long haul, uh, that may not be, you know, ideal uh, for companies that do, you know, a little bit more regional uh, and you've got it, uh, your, your, your geography is tighter for your materials. Um, it works very well. So we've seen that come into play. Uh, initially, when it started, there was quite a bit of change, uh, you know, change in production, uh, that type of thing, because uh, clients were still working through it. But we see this as something that's going to be long term because it it has been able to uh, allow us to commit capacity. And it has helped our customers realize that, you know, if we can do this ahead of time, uh, our market, you know, spot market um, exposure is much, much less. Yeah, and I think that speaks again to the power of data. And I know, Carly, you've referenced that as well um, in, you know, just better information about what's coming. Um, and speaking of which, I, I know that we're right up against the clock here. So, um, Brian, are there any uh, closing closing comments you wanted to add? No, I would just say that if, if the audience has any further questions, uh, still get those submitted. We'll pass them along to the panelists and we'll, we'll be able to answer them as, as best we can. Uh, but other than that, thank you. A big thank you to the panelists. I know you're very busy people. Took an a good amount of time out of out of your lives here and so we appreciate that um also thank you to courtney uh nancy joe and uh carrie who did a lot of work behind the scenes uh, did a great job putting everything together so again any questions get those submitted and we'll um, other than that um thank you all for your time and everyone have a good day thank you guys Thanks. Thanks, everyone.